The year is 2287 and humanity for the most part is still rebuilding the world after the Great War hit them back in 2077, over 200 years ago. Whilst communities out within the capital wasteland attempt to help get clean water to support their people, out within the Commonwealth, most significantly within Boston, communities there are desperately trying to rebuild settlements to create safe havens for those seeking shelter, as well as building up their farms to resupply food to all of those around. Boston, despite its destruction, however, looks like a world getting back on its feet. Colour still litters the land from the old world. The old baseball stadium has been transformed into a grand city called Diamond City, where people can trade and relax, and greenery has started to blossom once again. But saying all that, the Commonwealth is still plagued with troubles similar to that of other areas of America. Super mutants and other heavily radiated individuals still roam the land, seeking to wipe out all those who get in their way. Bandit camps try to take land from those who look weak, and other factions seek to turn the world into what suits their needs, leading to yet again more corruption and wars between one another. But gangs and super mutants, whilst dangerous, are not what most of the population fear. In all communities, rumours arise about a secret organisation, creating human-like beings known as synths who roam the land, setting up homes within towns and cities and spying on their communities and taking from the people. Being unable to differentiate between human and synth, this would create overwhelming paranoia throughout communities, with newspapers such as the Public Occurrences writing articles about these dangerous synths who roam the land, accusing even the mayor of Diamond City as being a synth working for this mysterious group. This secret organisation, only known as a rumour, would be said to be called the Institute, and would in fact be real, hidden away from all life on the surface, not allowing anyone to come into its facility, or if they did, they would not be able to leave. This Institute would house some of the best technology the world had ever seen, even being better than some pre-war technology, and as they continue to research within their headquarters, the Institute would seek more and more answers about the outside world, using their synths to perform their tasks. But who are the Institute? When did they set up? What is their overall goal? And what have they been up to all of this time? Well, in today's video, we explore the mysterious and terrifying scientific organization known as the Institute, as well as why they are the worst thing to happen to the Commonwealth. This is the story of the Institute within Fallout 4. Before the Great War, the organisation of the Institute wasn't really a thing. At least it wasn't documented as such. Instead, before the war, all of the scientists who would go on to set up this organisation would be based within the Commonwealth Institute of Technology, located within the city of Cambridge. This whole college campus was filled with academic facilities and areas of research with buildings such as the campus law offices, Greeny Tech Genetics, Cambridge Polymer Labs, and of course the CIT Rotunda. The CIT was known for its technological prowess, working closely on nuclear technology, with even their whole facility being powered by an experimental nuclear reactor, which would be based below the university there. The most significant thing that was to come out of the CIT before the war was a creation known as the Code Defender, a piece of security software that would revolutionise protection for a business or any institution that would want to use it. It was so good that apparently it was and still is largely uncrackable by anyone wanted to break into it, showing how how incredible the researchers were working within the CIT. As the war came in 2077, the people working within this organisation would seek refuge underground, taking down a lot of their research with them, so they could continue what they had been working on now safe away from the bombs. For a while, these residents lived underground, continuing like all the other sealed away communities did, but still the organisation of the Institute had not been fully set up. It wasn't until the children of the original survivors grew to maturity where they would begin digging further down into the earth in a hope to set up a new, sophisticated residential facility, which would include laboratories and starting a process of infrastructure expansion. As they set up this world, they would begin to develop their research as if life had not changed and they were going back to normal. For the most part, the people living underground didn't even care about what was going on up on the surface and disregarded the mayhem and destruction occurring outside of its 
grounds, but they did want to venture up there to help develop their research and gather resources from the surface. With this, the people of the new institute started creating the first generation of synths, extremely basic robot humanoids that would be able to venture to the radiated surface without a worry of the effects. After creating these first gen synths, the people underground would also create a stabilized government to try and bring about a true old world style of government, whilst also using the synths to work peacefully with the people of the Commonwealth. However, as usual, mistrust spread throughout the alliances and infighting started between the two groups, causing fights to break out and the people of the new underground society to go back into isolation once again, unwilling to help those on the surface due to the recent falling out. Isolation was a blessing for the Institute community, however. Not having to share with the outside world, they were able to continue their research and create pieces of technology that went far above anything they had made prior to the war. This meant that to the Institute, pre-war technology was seriously not as good as their new creations, making them far more advanced than anyone else within America. This meant that even if they made contact with the outside world, their knowledge was so complex that Wastelanders would not even be able to understand what they were talking about, creating a real barrier between them and the outside world. One example of a piece of technology that was extremely complex and way above anything in the Wasteland was the Molecular Relay Teleporter that was created within the 2180s. With this technology, it allowed them to completely seal themselves off from the outside world, with no need for doors, elevators, secret entrances, or anything like that. There was only one way into the Institute, and that was through the Molecular Relay Teleporter, which could only be accessed by extremely important individuals within the Institute, as well as some of the synths. A technology so far in advance that the only other people who have access to it are the Think Tank in the Big Empty and the Zetan Aliens. However, both of those factions were able to teleport single individuals, whereas the Institute was able to teleport multiple individuals, meaning it was the most advanced technology out there, even better than alien tech. On top of this, the Institute continued to develop their synth technology, creating Gem 1s as well as the new Gen 2s who looked much more genuine compared to the Gem 1s. However, still looked artificial and clearly not human. But with these developments, the Institute continued to send them out on research missions to the surface. And because of this, it was a clear sign to the Wastelanders that the Institute was still active, despite not seeing any of their actual organization members for ages since their first contact with them. But despite sending the synths out to gather materials and perform experiments on the Wasteland, the scientists stayed hidden within their new utopia of the Institute, continuing to develop their technology and not caring for anyone other than themselves. But as time progressed on, it became clear that the Gen 2 synths were as far as their technology could go. Whilst the Gen 2s were advanced and much better than the Gen 1s, they still had a lot of limitations that the Institute wanted to overcome. On top of this, metal synthetic materials were becoming limited, and they needed to find a new solution to help them continue their synth development. In this time, they tried experimenting on a version 2.5 of the synth program, where two synths would be made to see if they could handle independent thinking. These two synths would be named Dima and another one which would later go on to be named Nick Valentine. But as their independent thinking grew, the two synths hated the experiments they were being put under, making them resent the Institute, form a brotherly bond, and eventually broke out of their grasp. But the Institute were able to change the personality and memories of Dima's brother before this, and as they both left, that synth would go on to identify himself as a pre-war police officer named Nick Valentine, who had somehow woken up 200 years in the future. This change in personality would see the two split up and go their separate ways to see what the Wasteland had on offer and live away from the Institute's clutches, even though Nick was unaware of his true past, for now at least. After this series of events and after their synth experiments left, the Institute came up with the idea of creating synthetic flesh that they would use as the basis of their next synth project. Here, Dr. Frederick ran the project and collected FEV samples to start the process of creating organic synthetics. But this created a moral dilemma for many of the scientists within the bioscience division. But despite objections from some of the other scientists, the project still went ahead. Dr. Frederick 
ordered the abductions of men and women from the Commonwealth wasteland, and as they were brought back to the Institute, were then submerged into the Institute's modified FEV, to then be monitored with their mutations being noted down and tracked on a regular basis. This research went on for some time until the year of 2224, where it would ground to a halt. Whilst the team working on the research did create two perfect FEV strains for the project, the radiation that would be pumped into the individual was causing too much damage and was just too much of an obstacle for the scientists to work with. The Institute needed a new plan to solve their synth problem, and fast as without a solution, they would not be able to make synths at all, forcing the individuals to break their isolation and venture up to the surface on their own. But the solution did not come until the year 2227, as Institute researchers found perfectly preserved individuals still within the cryopods within Vault 111, one of them being the one-year-old boy known as Sean. With this knowledge, the Institute sent the mercenary Comrade Kellogg to Vault 111 to retrieve Sean. Entering Vault 111, Kellogg, along with his two Institute technicians, revived Sean and his parents, killing the parent holding Sean in their arms and forcibly taking him and venturing back to the Institute. The other parent, however, was once again frozen and would not wake again for another 60 years, filled with hatred and the determination to find their son who was taken from them and to seek revenge for their partner who was killed in cold blood right in front of their eyes. Heading back to the Institute, Sean was raised as one of their own, with him being seen as their saving grace, allowing them to finally come up with a way to develop their third generation of synths. This was all because Sean's DNA was from the pre-war, and because he was perfectly frozen, he would be able to be used for their project without the worry of radiation or other mutated strands within his DNA. With this, Sean was labelled as father, as he became the reason for a whole new generation of synthetic beings. Kellogg, on the other hand, was given enhanced cybernetics, which helped slow his aging process and extend his lifespan. This would be a process that the Institute would work on to help their workers within the headquarters. However, as Sean grew up, he went on to shut this project down, but leaving it crossed a line and went against their principles of preserving humanity, with this process being just a bad amalgamation of biology and technology, meaning humans weren't really fully humans anymore. But regardless of this failed idea, the new synth process was to finally go ahead. Here the third gen synths were finally created, looking incredibly lifelike, making them almost indistinguishable from normal adult humans. This was a huge milestone for the Institute and their research had now gone into a new era. However, two years later, the Commonwealth would become aware that this was a new threat to their everyday living, and the Institute was back now with a far more terrifying prospect. In the year of 2229 within Diamond City, one man known as Mr. Carter joined a group of patrons at the town's central bar. Mr. Carter had a very vague backstory, but saying that he was from the West, the group got to talking, sharing their stories about the Commonwealth and what they had witnessed within their travels. As the group continued to talk about their experiences into the evening, Eustace Hawthorne, the only remaining witness of the event, noticed that Mr. Carter's smile had suddenly faded from his face, with his cheeks starting to twitch. As his cheeks continued to twitch, he suddenly unexpectedly drew his revolver and without emotion or hesitation shot the bartender Henry in the head. After that, Mr. Carter continued to execute several other individuals within the bar until eventually the city guards arrived and opened fire on him. Carter put up a huge fight showing insane strength, throwing individuals left and right until finally he was put down by the security. After this event, the body of Mr. Carter was investigated and it was revealed that there was an undisclosed amount of plastic and metal throughout his body. It became quite clear from this that Carter was in fact not human, despite looking the epitome of one. He was in fact a synth created by the Institute. But the Institute didn't order this. Carter was not ready for field testing as he had not been fully approved by the scientists. This caused the director of the Institute at the time to become furious with the actions of his organization as it threatened decades of work to keep them out of the spotlight within the Commonwealth and with it he sought out to find those responsible. But for the people of the Commonwealth, the Institute had shown signs of aggression with their new generation of synths who could be under the guard 
eyes of anyone. This caused huge paranoia with neighbours not trusting one another. Outsiders who were not known would be heavily scrutinised as it would not be clear if they were truly human or synth and articles were to be published on a regular basis about the dangerous organisation known as the Institute. This was further not helped as citizens such as Charlie Fallon had mysteriously disappeared without explanation given, leading most to believe it was the Institute who were taking individuals and replacing them with synth replicas. All of this led to anti-synth groups forming, whose sole purpose was to take out anyone who acted mysteriously and sought harm on their societies. Whilst the Institute stayed isolated away from the outside world, with their incredible new research, they had become known within the wasteland, which is not what their director at the time wanted. But despite this setback, the Institute continued making Gen 3 synths and developing their technology in the hope that maybe the wasteland would forget about their presence and they could go back the way they were prior to the Diamond City event that was labelled as the Broken Mask Incident. After the events of 2229, the Institute continued to conduct their research and experiments, trying hard not to focus on the opinions of the public up on the surface, who were now terrified of the possibility of Institute synths spying on their land and stealing their loved ones. Despite having the answer to their synth problem with Father joining their ranks, the FEV research effort still continued for several more decades despite it not really providing any useful research and developing more super mutants for the Wastelanders to have to deal with. But eventually the FEV research was shut down when the new leader of the project, Dr. Brian Virgil, who headed the research in 2286, decided to go against the will of the Institute and abandon their premises, turning rogue and fleeing into the Commonwealth. Despite yet another setback, the Institute continued on once again, even after they had fully set up an effective organic synth project, able to manufacture synths every minute of the day. But with this, the Institute was facing shortages within its power budget, with its main source of power being used on the molecular dematerializer, the only way for them to go in and out of the facility. A lot of the pre-war technology around the area was also needing regular maintenance to make sure that all of their operations went ahead with ease. Without that power, they would effectively be doomed. This set up on their new goal, which was to make sure the Institute was completely independent on how it made its energy. By restarting the ancient nuclear reactor that was once used by the CIT, providing them with near limitless power. But this wasn't their only goal during this. In fact, the way the Institute works is by different sectors. The Directorate is made up of individual heads of each division, with one of them being appointed as the overall director. By the year 2287, that person is Sean, a aka father. Within each of these divisions, different experiments and pieces of research go ahead, with a real focus on individual projects to enhance their society and help build them further. But despite all working for the same overall goal, divisions are kept quite isolated from one another, with none of them discussing their projects in a fear that someone could do what Dr. Brian Virgil did, fleeing the base, exposing all of their research. The Advanced Systems branch is headed by Dr. Madison Lee, working on advanced applied physics such as plasma weaponry and teleportation, as well as a special project which is currently classified. This group of individuals look at developing the weapons and armor of the synths and institute members to make sure they are all well protected and armed for when they make it to the surface to conduct their research. This team also runs the robotics lab, which is where the synths are made on a regular basis, as well as managing their upgrades so they are ready for deployment. But the main primary focus is starting up the massive fusion reactor that will help solve the Institute's power needs for the future. The Bioscience Division, headed by Clayton Holdren, works on developing fields of botany, genetics, and medicine. This team creates crop production, pharmaceuticals, genetic engineering, and all biotech advancements. Whilst most of their focus is on creating fertile soil to help crops grow, as well as creating synth versions of gorillas to see what potential they could have for the future of the wasteland, one of their more hidden projects, which is only a rumor at the moment, is to keep studying the FEV virus. But instead of developing it into the synth project like they did before, this time they would be looking to reverse engineer the virus to create a cure for all those affected by it. Whilst this is still a rumour and it's in its early stages, it is clear that this division's sole program is to make sure the health of its inhabitants is monitored and their food and medicine is always the best it can be. The facilities division is one that doesn't really get a lot of notice within the institute, but it's one of the most important within the whole organisation. This group 
is led by Ali Fillmore, who helped the Institute operate on a day-to-day -day basis. This division services all of the life support systems, the ventilation, as well as the power network. Without this group, the power would shut down for the Institute and their whole life would come to an end. These tasks of monitoring the air system, the water systems, and the power systems are all run by Gen 1 synths, who do the manual labor opportunities and jobs a lot of humans don't want to do or can't do due to dangerous areas. Once again, without the facilities division, the Institute would not be what it is. And the final division is a key one for the Institute and the outside world. This one being the Synth Retention Bureau, headed by Justin Ayo. This group was set up to simply track down and return any rogue synths to the Institute. This group creates one of the most important synths to the Institute known as the Corsa, who have been tweaked so much that they could never rebel against their masters. And on top of that, their combat abilities are far higher than any of the other synths out there. Meaning that when it comes to taking them out, it is near impossible for a lone individual to take them out. But not only do the SRB go out to look for rogue synths, they also look to hunt down railroad members and try to shut down this rebel organization. The SRB shows a clear sign that the relations within the wasteland are still hostile, despite the Institute trying desperately to not be in the spotlight. But thanks to the setup of the SRB, it means they could constantly monitor what is going on within the wasteland to make sure there is no one out there trying to plan an attack and expose the Institute's secrets. Whilst the courses do shut down a lot of the individuals who oppose the Institute, the organization still ventures up to the surface, utilizing their synths to conduct research and conduct experiments on the land. One main example of the involvement on the land was within the area known as the Warwick Homestead, which was targeted to test genetically modified seeds to see its fertility and how they grow within the land with all the external factors affecting it, such as weather and acidity of the soil. Whilst this might have been seen as a harmless task, the Institute went to actually abduct him, Roger Warwick, the owner of the land, processing him to gain intelligence and then creating a replica synth to oversee their experiment and post their findings back to the Institute. But it's not only focusing on wildlife. The Institute makes sure that if anyone finds any important technology throughout the land, they will go in and do everything they can to secure it for themselves. University Point was one key example of this as Jacqueline Spencer found when she uncovered pre war research on reactor efficiency and tried to find a buyer via a caravan. The Institute found this information and using synths demanded that the town who housed it hand it over immediately. The town however refused to hand it over to the Institute and because of this the SRB moved in and destroyed the town and everyone within it. Whilst most people are still skeptical about the existence of the Institute, other factions know of their presence and see them as an instant enemy. The Brotherhood of Steel for example are the Institute's prime rival as they both seek out the same technology. Whilst the Institute tries desperately to show shut down the Brotherhood, it is clear that they really don't want to engage in a full-fledged war with them, so look to take out their forces in other means. The second threat to the Institute is the Railroad, an underground organization who look to save rogue synths who have escaped from the Institute and want their own life. This rebel organization is a danger to the Institute as they desperately try to expose the Institute's true actions and disrupt their ultimate plans and pieces of research. However, to the Institute, the Railroad is but a minor inconvenience convenience, and whilst they will try and shut them down every chance they get, they are not the priority on their list. That still belongs to the Brotherhood of Steel, especially within the year of 2287. However, saying that, it is rumoured that within the Institute itself, railroad sympathisers are on the rise and operate within their sectors. Whilst this is dangerous for the Institute, internal security doesn't really devote much time to rooting them out, as they are just considered a minor nuisance for them to deal with. As the year of 2287 progresses on, the Institute is still conducting its research, advancing its synth programme and continuing to run its experiments around the Commonwealth. Whilst they may seem like just a group of scientists looking to create the next stage in human evolution and the only way for humanity to progress, their means of doing this is terrifying for the people of the Commonwealth. Abductions are still a regular occurrence. If you find technology that is of importance to them, this group can send in synths to take it from you or burn down your town if you oppose them. And their spies could have you come face to face with a courser if you threaten to expose 
expose their existence. What started as just a group of scientists fleeing underground to avoid the Great War has now turned into an organization determined to do anything in their power to conduct their research and preserve their way of life. Their technology is certainly something worthy of note. However, the threat they put on the wasteland is scary to even think about. As the Institute continues on facing against the Railroad and the Brotherhood of Steel, it would be down to the actions of the sole survivor from Vault 111, who was tracking down their son Sean, now known as Varda, who would be the turning point for the Institute. If they were to side with their son, they could help the Institute thrive even further and be the next step for humanity. But if they were to see the true goal of the Institute, they could be the one to destroy their director their own son, and destroy everything they had set up, allowing for the people of the Commonwealth to be saved from the terrifying organization who threatens their existence using deadly synths to do their dirty work. Their fate lies solely in the hands of their leader's parents, who can either make or break them. But saying that, their presence is also known within the capital wasteland, as some rogue synths have been known to escape their clutches and are now on the run. Maybe if more broke out, the presence of the Institute could run further than just the Commonwealth. For that, we will have to wait and see what happens in the future. But for now, this has been the story of the underground, mysterious, and terrifying organization known as the Institute. And that is the relatively short background of the organization known as the Institute, the makers of the synths, and the ones who are manipulating the life of those on the surface. Sadly, there isn't much lore on them, which is a shame because they could be something really interesting with lots of stories to be told, but maybe in the future they will be expanded upon. Because for now, they are just a small organization who couldn't really take over the country even if they had the technology for it, especially against the Enclave. Then again, they could have a huge synth army to do it, but that is yet to be fully seen as of yet. But I hope you all enjoyed this video anyway. If you did, please do give it a like, leave a nice comment and subscribe if you haven't already. Check out my other playlists if you want more content like this. And if you really, really like this content, then why not support me on Patreon or as a YouTube channel member for early access to these videos, as well as them being completely ad free. And speaking of, I'd like to thank my supporters real quick. Big thanks to our small fish guys, our big fishes, Sacrum, Christopher, Andrew, Last Persona User, and Arto Krem, our shark, Wow Such Gaming, and our huge megalodons, Sinus, Jacob Garcia, Chernobyl Stalker, Shadow SGT, and Ryan Everett. Also, big shout out to our YouTube channel members, our wise ones, Jambu and Fiery Italian, as well as all my amazing subscribers over on Twitch if you're still there. I promise I will go back soon. Maybe when we hit that 50,000 milestone. So, yeah, I'll see you back on there soon. I promise. All of your support means the world to me and it means I can make these videos for you guys so thank you all so much but that is all for now thank you for bearing with me during the short break and thank you for watching this video it really means a world to me and I shall see you all in the next one cheers <laughs>